All right, there's a brand new book that is about to be released called The Best Argument for God. The book is a compelling read for anyone interested in the topics of philosophy, apologetics, worldview comparison, and it's available right now for pre-order on Amazon uh, with what looks to be a, a release date of October 17th of this year, 2023. So I'm delighted to be joined uh, by the author of this great book, Pat Flynn, who is here to talk to us about it. Pat, welcome to Think for Christ. Anthony, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. Pat, I can tell from the title of this work that you are someone who likes to make modest claims. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said it's the best argument. I didn't say it was a good argument, right? Uh, <laughs> no, I know. love it. Very now, provocative. Day, I, think, I think it's actually quite compelling, but uh, you can always qualify things, right? Yeah. Uh, would you mind just taking a minute or two to introduce yourself to the Think for Christ community? Yeah, of course. Again, thanks for having me here. It's a real joy. So my name is Pat Flynn. Uh, I host the podcast Philosophy for the People, which is a, I always have a good time over there. We're exploring many of the great philosophical ideas, always from a kind of Christian perspective, but we feel it's important to explore, yeah, the entire range of the, of the great ideas. Um, <clears throat> my background academically is in philosophy, but I've got my... Um, Got a lot of irons and a lot of different fires. So this will be my sixth book. I've got other books on lots of other subjects. One's hanging up there. That's actually on skill acquisition and entrepreneurship. I've got some some books on kettlebells and stuff as well. So I I fancy myself as something of a of a generalist, which maybe it means I'm just doing a whole bunch of stuff and not particularly good at at any of it. Uh, but philosophy has always been my 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 greatest and and longest love. It's what I take most seriously. Uh, and for, I guess, what would be most relevant for your audience is for uh, much of my philosophical lifespan, I got interested in philosophy at a very young age. Like like most people, I think I was kind of haunted by those deep existential questions Like for as long as I even have memories. I can remember just like looking out my grandparents' windows when I was just a couple of years old and just like thinking, how do I know this isn't all a dream and stuff like that, right? Um Cartesian skeptical scenarios without having any idea that there is anybody who ever thought this weird stuff uh, ever before, right? And then you realize, oh, there's lots of other weird people out there, and they call them philosophers, right? Uh, but anyways, uh, as I kind of got into high school, and especially by college, I was pulled into the world of philosophy, sort of through the atheist, atheistic existentialists. Um, and that that colored my perspective for a long time. You know, I, I grew up in a, a very... Um, just not religious environment, just a very nominally religious environment. So I never had any real religious formation or catechesis, but at the same time, I, I never had anything against religion, for example, right? You know, um, I had no particular, you know, beef with it, if you will, well, for whatever reasons, political or otherwise. I just, for many years, I just thought that there weren't any good reasons really to believe in God or to be a religious person. Until that is, I really started trying to systematically work out the naturalistic worldview. Uh, and for reasons I'm sure we will get into as this conversation progresses, I did not find it to be adequate. Uh, and this caused me to want to consider another paradigm. Uh, so, so thus began my great exploration into classical theism. And from there, um, this is a very wandering journey over many years, of course, I'm giving the condensed version. Uh, I began to say take seriously after I came to a pretty firm commitment of a classical theistic worldview, uh, the possibility of revealed religion and Christianity. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's where I am, where I am now. And I wanted to write this book um, because I actually think that one of the best arguments against God um, is really in an interesting way it's it's the other argument against god that saint thomas aquinas considers in his summa so for people who are familiar with thomas aquinas uh, and um, the section on the existence of god in his summa he only considers two objections against the existence of god now this is interesting because aquinas is usually the kind of guy who's like hey here's 57 objections right. to some weird position and now let's systematically go and refute them but when it comes to like a really big ticket question like god's existence which he obviously cares about he only he only gives two objections, right? Um, well, at least in this, at least in the Summa. Um, one is the problem of evil, which we're all familiar with. And I do treat that in the book at length. It's the final chapter. But the other one really is, it's something like this, Anthony. It says, uh, hey, the principles of nature are enough, right? We don't need God to explain anything. We can get all the explanatory 
oomph we need just from within the natural world, right? Uh, and what's what, and that was sort of what I thought for many many years, right? And it's also an objection that has, for better or worse, stood the test of time. A lot of contemporary naturalists seem to like this line of thought. So even though Aquinas only considers two objections, I think he considered the two best ones. He was yeah. kind of good at the steel man game, right? Um, so in contemporary form, it, it, the objection against God or the argument against God might say something like this. It might say, hey, if two theories explain just as much, believe the simpler theory. Well, classical theism and metaphysical naturalism, they explain just as much, but naturalism is simpler. So you should be a naturalist, right? And my book is really just trying to not just break that argument, but reverse it. So yeah. the whole you know, the whole best argument for God is really just to substantiate the thesis that naturalism can only explain some, but not all of what classical theism can when strapped with far greater complexity. So yeah. be a classical theist. So in a way that really sets me up to make many different arguments as, as right. you, I'm sure you realize as you read through the book, it is, it is quite a cumulative case. It's not just, well, just one argument. It is a cumulative case and you do an excellent job. I highly recommend the book. Um, one of the things that's unique about this book, I think, is the structure that you bring in the layout. Um, the first part of the book, generally, you pursue a more what you call traditional metaphysical approach for inferring the existence of God. Mm -hmm. And then in the second part of the book, you take the more contemporary approach of worldview comparison that you've been explaining here. So talk to us about that. What are these two approaches for arguing for theism? And why did you want to include both of them in your book? Yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, well, a lot of it's personal. So as I was seriously investigating the question of God's existence, I realized that there's there, there are different methodologies of how people would think about God. Uh, and there's more than two, but there's two that really caught my attention and seemed highly plausible, to say the least. So there's like the, the old school traditional approach. And this is where you could take thinkers like Aristotle, even Plato and Thomas Aquinas. And what they're doing is they're starting as metaphysicians out in the field. You always picture the metaphysician just out in the field, right? And they're carving reality at its joints, right? They're really just sort of delineating the intelligible structures of nature. And and then what they're doing, you know, in like a metaphysical way, uh, which we can get into as we, as we move along, right? Uh, and they're doing this to really make sense of what they feel are common if not undeniable experiences like how do we make sense of change for example that was something that really interested aristotle right and then he would have his divisions of being of potency and act and, and all that we can get into that later if we want but anyways after they're kind of you know done this project in philosophy of nature and they transcend in metaphysics they ask the question of okay well what are the necessary conditions for all that stuff right for changing things for composite things for finite things and then what they'll argue is the necessary condition for all that stuff is something that sort of transcends all those categories, right? If there are changing things, there must be an immutable thing. If there are finite things, there must be a qualitatively infinite thing, right? If there are composite things, metaphysically composite things, there must be that metaphysically simple thing, right? This is the only way that we're going to get ultimate intelligibility of the world, right? Which they assumed was the case, right? They didn't think the world was fundamentally absurd, which is a pretty critical assumption, but I think a one that most people are willing to go with, right? And so this old school approach, we might call a metaphysical demonstration. They would say that these are proofs for the existence of God, right? Insofar as we're starting from very secure starting points, not maybe not utterly undeniable, but if you deny them, the costs are very high, right? Like that change occurs or something like that. And then giving a deep conceptual analysis of what the necessary conditions are of that, you wind up for this sort of anchor, this transcendent anchor that bears all the divine attributes, traditional divine attributes, immutability, omniscience, omnipotence, absolute ontological simplicity, eternality, so on and so forth, right? All done through a deep conceptual analysis, right? This is the obviously the sub, the executive summary version. There's a lot of details all this, right? Sure. I always found that pretty cool and ultimately compelling at the end of the day, right? However, it's not the only way that philosophers have thought about the existence of God. There's this more kind of new school way or contemporary approach um, that that either engages in worldview comparison or inference to the best explanation, stuff like that, right? And um, some representative examples, one might be like Richard Swinburne, for example, his book, The Existence of God, right? He sees God rather as, let's, let's present a sort of worldview or, or hypothesis, if you will, right? And here's what this hypothesis is. And then what we should do is kind of like 
be scientific about it, if you will, and see like, what does this hypothesis predict? What we, would we expect if this hypothesis was true? How well does that actually land with what we see uh, concerning the broad scale features of this world, the types of things that a worldview should explain, right? And more importantly, how does that compare with what a naturalistic worldview predicts and explains? Okay. Um, and what are some of these features? Well, it might be features like contingency, consciousness, morality, rationality, um, some some things that are just like common and accessible to all of us. Other things might be things that we only learn through, you know, deeper scientific exploration, like physical fine tuning, stuff like that. Right. Um, and then Swinburne and others will also argue that that, you know, explanatory comprehensive. This is just one theoretical virtue, but another one that's really important is simplicity. So then they'll make the case that, hey, um, yeah, this just seems like a more fruitful theory. It's at least as simple as naturalism, uh, but it explains a lot more. Um, so anyway, long, I shouldn't say long story short, because that was pretty long. But <laughs> I but but if you're familiar with these debates, you realize that philosophers typically prefer one or the other yes. approach, right? And if you're kind of old school, you don't like the new approach, right? Mm -hmm. You think that it's like too soft. You're like, no, we can give a really beefy, muscular argument for the existence of God. We don't need inference to the best explanation, right? We shouldn't just assign credences to the existence of God, right? We got the demonstration. God exists. End of story, right? Uh, whereas, you know, people in the other camp would be like, hey, you guys are just maybe a little too confident. Even those metaphysical demonstrations require assumptions that aren't absolutely unassailable, stuff like that, like maybe a broad realism or something like that, which I think is fair, fair and right. Yeah. Um, so then they'll say, uh, so actually our approach is probably the safer, better one. Plus it will appeal to more contemporary scientifically minded people who like this sort of reasoning, uh, method to begin with. Right. And I've always thought, well, this is kind of silly because clearly these, these things can play well together. Right. Um, so I think that there are like good metaphysical proofs, if you want to call it that for God, but it also, if you work through the sort of metaphysical approach to God, it gives you a really well-shaped hypothesis, right? Like it tells you a lot about what God is and what God isn't, which we can then kind of shift over to the other methodology and say, okay, well, from that, you know, very <laughs> painful metaphysical work we just did, right? What would we expect? What or what else would we expect from this hypothesis? How well does it anticipate certain other features of reality that we have yet to think about compared to atheist, atheistic uh, naturalism? In, and the reason that might be useful is because, okay, maybe somebody thought that the metaphysical demonstration we did was pretty good, but maybe they're not completely sold. Well, we can pick up additional confirmation yeah. now through this other methodology. So my thought was, why be enemies when we could be friends? It seems to me that that these methodologies can certainly play well together. And there's no reason to to, to pit them against each other when I think they can actually be quite harmonious. So Does the big story, I yeah, I mean, was. the big general claim in your book is however you bake the cake, theism comes out on top. Um, I really love the way that you set it up. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a classical guy. I'm... Um, I'm with the uh, medievals here. I think the best way to argue for God is what they call demonstratio quia, right. which is arguing from the effect to the cause. And, and here where we are giving a metaphysical demonstration in deductive form, which means, um, you know, if the premises are true, then the conclusion follows inevitably, right? Right. With necessity. So that's a strong argument, and I think it's a good argument. I think it's a powerful argument. I think you do a great job giving one version of that argument in the first part of your book. And I love the fact that you do it first, because you provide a demonstration, with I th which I think is conclusive and convincing. And then you say, all right, so we have the demonstration in our pocket, which if the premises are true, you know, the, the, the conclusion follows necessarily. But now that we have this demonstration, now that we have this conclusion, Let's go in for this abductive kind of reasoning, uh, inference the best explanation, mm -hmm. and let's see how theism, um, the kind of theism that we conclude to from this metaphysical demonstration, let's see how it plays in that arena. How does it do in terms of worldview comparison? And it turns out it does really, really well, classical theism at least. So I, like I said, I really, what's really unique about this book is just the methodology that uh, that you give us here, and and uh, I really want to commend you on that. You did you did a great job there. So well, well, th well, thank you. I'm certainly going to be the last person to reject a compliment like that, right? But I, <laughs> I humbly and graciously accept 
Um, and uh, yeah, just to th uh, real quick on the metaphysical demonstration is even when I'm trying to develop what is a, a broadly cosmological argument at the, at the start, I am that itself is sort of synthesizing. I don't know how obvious this was like different approaches in the tradition. Yeah. Um, where so like the Leibnizian approach with a Thomist approach, you, you provided kind of both of those. Yes. And there was actually two. Uh, formulations uh, originally, but one of them got cut because it was just issues of of length and um, and frankly tediousness, right? Um, but I mean, just just to be just to be absolutely fair, like I said, a lot of these demonstrations is they do start from starting points that I think a lot of people, at least in their common sense, everyday mode of existence, are going to be on board with. Um, but they're not absolutely unassailable, right? That it, so so for, for me, it's it's OK, let's just get as many points on the board and show what the costs are going to be That's if you're right. going to try and escape this argument. Right. And they're, they're they're pretty absurd. Like if you want to deny that change occurs or that everything actually has an adequate explanation. But one one aspect that I but I even try to develop, at least in seed form in, in the initial argument, is that uh, and I'm sure we can get into this a little bit more, Anthony, is even though I kind of build out and defend what I think is a sort of necessary, explainable, uh, explanatory principle namely a restricted form of the principle of sufficient reason. I do show how you can run the cosmological argument without that. Um, and but but that itself requires a, a certain um, metaphysical background, particularly of existence, what existence right. is and how it relates to concrete individuals. So there are like different paths you can take to still kind of push the argument through. For sure. If somebody tries to be hyper skeptical about something that I think is unreasonable to be skeptical about. Right. And that's Look, what you, I've always. Kind of, yeah. And people can always be. I mean, skepticism is easy and it's free and it's right. not hard to be a skeptic. I think the, the job cool. of the apologist or the philosopher who's defending theism is to raise the cost of, of your skepticism. Right. You know, if you're going to deny the principle of causality, well, I think theism wins at that point. If you're going to deny some version of the principle of sufficient reason. Once again, I think theism wins because if you can back someone into a corner where they have to deny something that I think is so obviously true, what else can you ask for when it comes to providing a good argument for the existence of God? You know, these arguments are not compelling in the sense that they're going to grab you and force you to the conclusion that God exists. I mean, I don't think there is such an argument outside of seeing God himself, like what happens in the book of Job, there is no compelling argument that's just going to force you to believe right. in God. But what we can do is we can raise the cost of agnosticism and atheism and naturalism so high that it does become unreasonable, I think, um, to maintain some of these positions in the face of some of the denials that you have to engage in. Yes. Um, and, and yeah, that's I, I agree with all those points. I think that's that's very, very well stated. And sometimes that's the best you can do in a philosophical right. project. And you try to make a cumulative effort to that effect. Right. Uh, but it's also important to situate the context. Right. And the context is we are probably dialoguing with people that share this assumption of intelligibility in explaining. I mean, in fact, one of the, the core arguments I'm arguing against is that naturalism, and theism are on an explanatory par. Right. <laughs> that that things can be explained. Um, that we don't just wind up with brute absurdities, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that's right. You know, different, I guess, different strokes for different folks and, and different contexts here or there. Um, so yeah, um, that you can only do what you can do with philosophy at the end of the day, which I think is quite a lot. But there are, I do still, too. There are there are still limits to what can. Well, be. Well, we're both Christians, and we all ultimately know at the end of the day, it's not just an intellectual problem. We're facing right. a moral problem here at the end of yeah. the day. So. Well, if, yeah. if you don't mind, let's let's go ahead and, and talk about that first section of the book just for a sure. bit here. Um, that does concern that metaphysical approach, which we have been kind of dialoguing about here. Yeah. So you, you begin your case for classical theism by considering the question, that perennial question, why is there something rather than nothing? And right. you explain helpfully that there are uh, three basic ways of answering this question, three mm -hmm. stories uh, that try to account for the existence of things. And these are what you call... Number one, the further story account. Number two, the same story account. And then number three, the no story account. Can you just kind of walk us through these options? Yeah, well, you might remember my book better than I do at this point because you probably read it more recently. <laughs> <laughs> but let me see if I can dust the cobwebs off. Right. So a uh, little background again, very quickly, when it comes to sort of cosmological arguments or contingency type arguments, 
uh, you're right. We're, we're going from effect to cause generally, but we're kind of locating something within the natural world that doesn't seem totally self-sufficient, uh, that doesn't really explain itself, right? Uh, and there's lots of different features or categories that philosophers have sort of focused in on. We highlighted a few of them. Um, finitude is one. Uh, mutability is another. Compositeness is another. And I do pick up compositeness a little bit later. But one of the most um, prominent and indeed contemporary is this notion of contingency, right? And the idea of contingency is that there are things that that are, but they need not have been, right? There's nothing about what they are, their essence or their nature that sort of guarantees or demands their existence. Reality did not have to include these things, yet here they are. Why, right? This is sort of the why is there something rather than nothing, right? Or why is there something contingent and not nothing instead type of question, right? And I, in the book, I kind of like to... Uh, if nothing else, I think the book may, might be helpful for people just like seeing the different ways philosophers have wrestled with big questions. Because I do like to, you know, try and map the terrain and 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 show the different stories philosophers tell. And I don't mean like stories and like just complete wild imaginative speculations, which is sometimes the case, but like venturing a plausible theory, right? Some narrative that actually wraps around the data. So I say when it comes to contingency, there's kind of like three broad stories that philosophers have told told. The first one is this idea of further story, right? And the idea there is just something pretty simple, right? There's something beyond contingency that explains it. And that would be necessity, whatever that is, right? That the contingent somehow is grounded in the necessary. And there's got to be some way that we can explain that the contingent arises from the necessary without also becoming necessary, right? Suffering a modal collapse, right? The other uh, story is uh, just more of the same story. Oh, we can make sense of contingency just by positing further contingency, right? It's just contingency all the way down, turtles all the way down, something like that, or turtles in a circle or something like that, right? Um, that's that's probably, I don't know how uh, in favor that view is these days, but it's 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 still around, right? And it, it, it's 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 been around for some time. And then the third view is that there's there's no story. Right. And this is the idea that, hey, uh, contingency just is. That's all. That's the end of it. Stop asking questions. Stop trying to make sense of it. It's a brute fact. Right. And you'll you'll hear this expressed by various atheists in different ways. Someone, you know, might think of Bertrand Russell when he says of uh, in his famous debate with uh, with Coppleston, Father Coppleston, the universe is just there. And that's all. Stop. Stop asking why. Right. Well, it seems like we should ask why about the universe, especially if we think that it is a contingent reality. It didn't need to be there. Right. And then what I try to do uh, in that section is just make the case of why I think further story is really the only good one <laughs> out of all the stories that have been told and kind of unpack the, the further implications uh, from there. So, yeah, those are the three the three main ways that I think philosophers try to seriously or unseriously, depending how you think about it, grapple yeah. with the issue. of And so much of this section relies on the uh, principle of sufficient reason, right? Um, yeah. If you believe that uh, there are sufficient reasons for the fact that things are and for the fact that things are the way that they are, mm -hmm. which I agree with you is kind of like the built in intuition that we all have before some clever philosopher comes around and disabuses us of that intuition. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the principle of sufficient reason takes central stage for you, um, at least in one half or at least in one version of the cosmological argument that you're using. Like you said, you, you kind of develop on the side a Thomistic version as well, alongside in parallel. So can you just unpack that uh, for the audience a little bit? What do we mean by the pr principle of sufficient reason and why think that uh, reality is intelligible through and through? Yes. Yeah, good. Well, one is, of course, just the, the basic appeal to common sense of intuition, right? We we encounter something, a cup, a house, and we think, well, why is that there, right? And why is it the way that it is, right? So whenever we hit something that has a sort of set of limits on it, intelligibility limits, right? It doesn't explain everything about itself just from within itself, just by itself. It isn't completely self-explanatory we kind of want something else to help make sense of it, right? Again, hugely common sense. This is the one of the driving motivations behind scientific investigation, mm -hmm. philosophical investigation. I don't think anybody denies that, right? The question is, um, is this like, is this a real principle of the world? That the world actually, this is how I would state it, right? That there is actually a coherent answer to every coherent question that can be asked. If there is a coherent answer to every coherent question that can be asked, 
uh, at least an adequate coherent answer, then the principle of sufficient reason is true, right? If not, if you get to something that just is there, but it's not completely intrinsically intelligible and there's no further story about it whatsoever at all, then the PSR is false, right? And so what I do at considerable length in that in that, in that that section, right, is give as many reasons as I can. I give a cumulative case within a cumulative case for thinking that the PS, PSR is, is actually true, right? And it's in a restricted form because many philosophers have said a lot of things about the PSR in, in various ways. Um, and so I sort of, I, I restrict it in a sense that I think it, it, it needs to be restricted to avoid certain absurd implications. Right. And, and really the restriction is quite modest. I just say that everything has an adequate, even if not determining explanation of its existence. And that's an important restriction because it, it leaves room for things to be explained by choice and it leaves room for freedom of the will and stuff like that. And it helps to avoid the issues we talked about of how do you get contingency from necessity and this project is supported through like i said a cumulative effort so i i defend psr from everything from from basic metaphysical intuition uh as it as a sort of uh necessary principle not just for science but if at least if we want to think that science is a genuine source of knowledge i support psr as necessary for the legitimacy of inference to the best explanation but also in the other way that you can use inference to the best explanation to support psr and namely that oh. is like why does the world seem like PSR is true. Well, best explanation is PSR probably is true, right? Um, things aren't just popping out of existence from nothing right. all the time. Like Ingve Malmsteen isn't just manifesting right in front <laughs> of me with no explanation, ripping a guitar solo, stuff like that, right? And then, of course, I give various retorsion arguments as well. Like say, hey, if you're going to deny PSR, here's probably all the stuff that's going to go with it, right? You're probably going to wind up in a pretty radical empirical skepticism. The moment that you say that things finite things can happen without any adequate sort of uh, causal explanation at all is the moment you open up uh, the possibility that even all your mental states are just occurring for no reason right. whatsoever, right? So now we've kind of lost any reliable link. It undermines uh, rationality. Yeah, I, I, and I do argue that. it's not. I argue that it's not just empirical knowledge that goes, but the very enterprise of rationality itself mm. depends on PSR. So this is, again, is my project of saying here are the costs, right? Uh, it seems like we have every good reason to think that PSR is true. It seems fundamentally absurd to even try and deny this, even if you um, do try and embrace that absurdity. Um, and one of the, the things that I think is important in a philosophical project is the costs have to be relevant to the person you're talking about, right? And if I'm talking to naturalists, naturalists care a lot about science, right? They think they're sort of yeah. all epistemology and ontology should be mapped by the sciences. Well, I, I try to make a pretty strong case that like, hey, Science is pretty buddy buddy with the PSR, right? right. Like you can kind of have them both or you can have neither, right? But as soon as you have the PSR, you got to leave naturalism behind. So that's a linking project I do. And then I also spend a considerable length looking at what I think are the best objections against PSR issues of freedom of the will and and stuff like that. And some of that gets a, a bit technical, but I don't think there's actually that many objections against the PSR that are that good. And once you have that restricted version in place, you can deal with most of them pretty easily. Right? Yeah, I so. agree. I think a lot of the arguments against the principle of sufficient reason are actually against a formulation that's too strong. Um, you, By the way, this is a great section in the book where you're talking about the PSR and defending it and addressing objections. Very well done. Um, but yeah, so the biggest objection is if you have a, something like a PSR, then you really can't have any kind of freedom or indeterminacy because if every effect needs a cause, then it just seems like every effect is going to be causally determined. But of course, um, the principle of causality doesn't imply uh, determination whatsoever. No. Uh, mm -hmm. It just says that if there's an effect, it had to have a cause to yes. bring it about, to produce right. it. It doesn't say Not anything about a necessitating cause. And then when you get into the uh, question of free will um, and you're looking at, for, for example, libertarian freedom, often the objections brought up, you know, how is a free choice, although it might be caused, how is it not just randomly caused? Right. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, if it's caused by some reason, then it seems like the reason determines what the choice is. But if the reason itself isn't determinately caused, then it seems like it's just pure randomness. Right? right. This is this is often known as the randomness objection to an account of of free will. And in and in working through this this little puzzle, 
uh, I think that we actually get a really cool account of contingency from necessity. So, so real quick, you know, d- d- uh, something being determined or random, those are logical contraries. They're not contradictories, right? As mm-hmm. I point out in the book. So like, is there some third thing? And I say there is some third thing, reasons-based action. Call it a constrained indeterminism or something like that, right? We're all very familiar with this, right? Uh, I have reasons for black coffee. I have reasons for creamed coffee, for example, right? And then I think once you take a deeper metaphysical analysis of what the human will is, and I go into this a bit in the book, right? The, the, not just a human will, but the will in general, right? Is just the power to make efficacious any finite, inherently non-determining emotive for action, right? Good. So, yeah. you know, in the greater metaphysical scheme, we think that the, the will is sort of determined only to the good as such. Ultimately, that would be God. But any sort of finite good is itself not powerful enough, if you will, to determine the will, right? So now we enter the space of reasons, right? Where we can consider the sort of pros and cons of everything, right? And the will just is the power to end deliberation. That's just what the will is, right? And once you understand that that is an act of power, you can then get inadequate, right? This is why I like sometimes instead of the PSR, I, uh, principle of sufficient reason, I sometimes like the principle of adequate reason, mm-hmm. right? And this is, this again, accords with common sense. Well, why did he do this? Well, he did it of his own free will. We often think that that's a totally adequate explanation, right? Um, and that w- once you understand the will as a sort of active power to end deliberation, to make efficacious any finite motive for action, to kind of bestow the dignity, as Jack Maritan says, mm-hmm. uh, the I choose you-ness, right? Not only um, does that make PSR compatible with libertarian free will, as I think it, it needs to be, uh, and obviously is, um, but it also helps on the deeper metaphysical level to explain how you get contingency from necessity. And the simple idea there, and I think this is the only really ultimately good one to avoid a randomly chaotic world, right? So if you're a naturalist, you might say, well, maybe it's just totally indeterminate. Okay, but total indeterminacy, if you have some sort of necessary reality, doesn't predict the order and stability we see, right? So what we want is something that can preserve contingency, but also still help us to get the general order and stability that we have in the world. And the best or only account that I've ever seen is one where God acts based on reasons. God acts based on reasons to create reasons that he need not have acted on. Yeah. Right. And that is how you get the contingent from the necessity, right? God is a necessary being is free. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can think about reasons also, um, in a space of its own, like we don't have to collapse reasons into causes. Right. Just because something is a reason for something doesn't mean that the reason caused, like if you have a reason to do some action, doesn't mean that that reason caused that action. Rather, right. uh-huh. you cause the action as an agent with a basic based power. Based on reasons. That's right. right. Yes. Based mm-hmm. on reasons. So mm-hmm. sometimes, sometimes you'll see, and this wasn't covered in your book, but it's in my mind right now, but sometimes you'll see um, someone try to challenge libertarian freedom by saying, well, okay, so the person chose X, but why didn't they choose Y? instead of x and i think this is another restriction on the principle of sufficient reason that we have to be aware of um we're not we don't need a contrastive explanation to have an explanation like to explain why i did x we don't also need to explain why i didn't do y right yes just just Mm -hmm. having an explanation for why i did x is sufficient that's all that that's all that's required and that's that's all that we should be defending Yes. Yeah, that's that's right. I do talk a bit about contrastive explanations in there. And I think that there's reason for not accepting a PSR that demands contrastive explanation. But again, like I think I, this is in the book. It's been a while since I, I wrote this section, but I think like to continue even asking that question in a certain sense just sort of either misunderstands or begs the question against the metaphysics of the will that we just talked about, right? The exactly. will just is the act of power to make efficacious any finite motive that did not need determine you. Right. Exactly. And it's it's important, like that. Even the term "cause" is something that historically has gotten pretty convoluted and confusing. Like in the in the most traditional sense, like "cause" just meant sort of any broad reason for for something, right? Like if you think of Aristotle's four causes, it's probably better translated as like the four explanations of something, the four uh-huh. ways that something is made intelligible. Whereas in contemporary uh, speak, causation is sort of just really meant in a sense of like a kind of mechanical efficient push and pull. right pushing yeah. right mm-hmm. so there's some ambiguities here that you often need to kind of sort through to, to make sure people aren't speaking across purposes right mm-hmm. sure yeah so we have the psr yeah it's it's defendable um it's aligned with common sense in our um 
pre-skeptical intuitions. So now that we have the PSR, how do we get to God from the PSR? Yeah, yeah. So there's there's many different paths, as you know. There's there's various different formulations. I explore a couple, but if we're just looking for an explanation, the the simplest might be something like this, right? If we're just looking at explanation of why is there anything of the type contingent whatsoever, right? Well, then to avoid a, a circularity, which I think would put us in violation of PSR, we just need to escape that category. We need something of the type necessary, right? Um, and then of course there's another stage. So like that that itself, actually, what we just did right there is not something that a naturalist need necessarily agree with, right? Uh, disagree with, I'm sorry. And there are many naturalists that accept that. Sometimes people call that the phase one of cosmological reasoning, right? Just contingency to necessity. And then there's the phase two, where you have to kind of move from necessity to deity, if you want, or show why the only thing that could be a robustly necessary reality is something that most people would consider to be God and not just some some natural finite entity or something like that. So that, that distinction is, um, I think, critically important um uh, i think it's also often quite overblown um i mean for most of the tradition most people thought that once you kind of transcended the category of contingency you were more or less at deity and i think for good reasons but I then totally again Aquin aquinas himself does spend in spill an enormous amount of ink showing why like once you once you transcend this particular category that he's interested in why what grounds that category for him it's pure actuality just is you know pure omnipotence pure goodness subsistent mm -hmm. being all that so it's not something that like people in the tradition never thought about right this is they thought about it uh quite deeply real quick though you know just as as a teaser in the book it's it's sort of at the end of the chapter if i remember right i do give a path um to god without the psr that i think is a sort of entailment of aquinas's metaphysics of existence right uh, if you remember that section about Thumper, the little the little bunny rabbit. Um, and I wanted to put that in there. This is I had a full chapter developing that argument at length. But again, it got cut. So I just kind of had to like sneak in the, the seed idea. But it's the idea that if you follow and this is one of the assumptions that you would have to, to kind of defend elsewhere or just uh, hope that people just hold on basic common sense that existence is something that you can really predicate of concrete individuals that right existence is something that individuals have or participated more or less. Right. That they're metaphysical composites following Aquinas of an essence element, a whatness element, and an isness element, an existence element. And what I do in that section, I'll just leave the readers to investigate the details, is I show like if you if you go with Aquinas that far, then what you can show is that considered just in say, just in and of themselves, any composite entity of essence and existence is actually a paradoxical contradictory structure, such that it could not exist unless it were a contingent entity, contingent in the sense that it's dependently contingent, that that there is something that is always bringing about or funding the unity of its constituents, right? So either this thing could not exist or it is caused to exist through and through. And I wanted to tease that, that out just to show, again, there's a path here where even if you, for whatever reason, I don't think you should be, are skeptical of PSR, that there are still other ways to reach the same conclusion. But the cool thing is this, right, is that there's there's also convergence and further confirmation. I think that when you think about Aquinas' theory of existence, it helps to itself provide a theory of contingency. Like, well, why are things contingent, right? Why can they kind of fall out of or away from existence? And Aquinas has, I think, a pretty good answer. They're contingent because they're metaphysically composite. Their essence yeah. does not include, guarantee, entail, whatever, their existence, right? That something needs to fund the unity of these metaphysical constituents, right? And points of convergence like that, at least personally, Anthony, have always struck me as like pretty powerful, right? Like Same, when, you, when yeah. you see things like that link up and line up, to me, that signals, okay, there's there's something right about this sort of picture, right? And we get this, this harmony and this mutual reinforcement. Right, so, we're hitting metaphysical bedrock here. Right. But the reason, the other reason I, I bring that up as well, Anthony, is that if, if you take Aquinas's position on this, right? Uh, whatever that necessary reality is will have to be something that just just is its existence. It just is pure existence itself, right? And this helps to bridge that that stage one and stage two gap pretty quickly. Because if again, there's some background metaphysics here that we probably don't have time to get into now. But for Aquinas, existence is actuality. If something is pure existence, it's pure actuality. It's going to be necessarily just existent, right? Because it just is its existence, right? It cannot not exist. It's going to be immutable, unchanging, right? It cannot sort of develop along any possible lines. It's always at the, the height of, of all possible perfection for an entity of that sort. 
It's going to be omnipotent in the sense that anything that is a possibility of being, right, that could be actualized must ultimately be actualized by this entity, right? That it's that it's one and only one, it's principle, it's primary, it's eternal, it's outside of time altogether, because for Aquinas, time is sort of the, the measure of change. And as uh, being its pure actuality, it's, it's immutable, so it doesn't change. It's not just everlasting, like it's eternal, right? It's outside of time. So the other reason I wanted to include this sort of more traditional Thomistic uh, insight in there is to show how the tradition provides other, I think, ultimately the best resources for bridging that gap between necessary reality and and deity or God of classical theism, if you like. And as and you say, all- Aquin- Aquinas does this, this stage two, which everybody thinks like, okay, this is the modern, this is the modern move, right? Let's right. let's figure out how we go from stage one, that there's a necessary being to stage two. Well, why should we think that this being is God? As if nobody has ever addressed this, but Aquinas is first, what, 50 questions is is him just kind of unpacking the entailments of his metaphysical arguments that lead to the existence of God. And these are entailments for Aquinas. They just kind of tumble out of the right. conclusion that God is pure act. Yes. And I still think his approach is the best. I mean, there's been some- As do cool I. Mm-hmm. And interesting, you know, contemporary insights of, you know, why a nece- just thinking just within the argument of contingency, why a necessary reality has to be God. But I've never found any of those as strong or as compelling as Aquinas's just traditional metaphysical path, right? Uh, but again, I think they could be friends, so I do try to to marry insights throughout the book. But I'm with you, man. I always I always found the Thomistic approach to be the most compelling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it does it does um, supply some explanatory depth, like you say, because the the argument from contingency is all the rage today. Um, you know, uh, philosophers of religion just love to talk about contingency and and yes. building arguments for the existence of God, and and that's great. Like you, I think I applaud that. I think it's awesome. But I think that even when you have a necessary being, you still haven't arrived completely at an understanding of uh, the sufficient reason for the existence of that necessary being in terms of the metaphysical nature of what that being must be like in order to explain why, in fact, it is a necessary being. Yes. And, and that's is, what Thomism yeah. gives you. And that's something I have. Um, I mean, that's that's the drum I've beaten for a long time, right? Like it, it. Yes. OK, I think it's right that we need necessity to ground contingency, but it's not enough just to call something necessary right. and leave it at that. Right. We need like, how could something be necessary? Like, that's a pretty right. remarkable thing to attribute to something like how the heck could something be a necessary existent right um it, like what we need is some sort of relevant difference right yes. it, it can't just be that this thing is like super big or chubby uh or that it <laughs> or has right? all the great it just happens to have all the great making properties or that it's just like temporally first or like these don't yeah. seem like relevant differences or that it has more sides right like these do not seem like relevant differences that could help to explain how something could be necessary in the first place what aquinas gives us is a relevant difference it's necessary because it's the only being and the only being that could be like this whose essence just is existence, right? Yes. Bam. Now we have a relevant, okay. Now, whether you think that notion is even coherent is a is a whole other question. I argue it is, right? But at least we have like a principled relevant difference now, right? Of why something is exactly. could be necessary versus something contingent. Because if you don't have exactly that- exactly what you want out of a theory. Right? Yeah, because yes. if you don't have that, I mean, it seems to me, and I, and I don't know that I've thought about this enough, but- it seems to me that on the one hand, if you don't take this Thomistic classical theistic approach, then on the one hand, you have theists, if I may say, like William Lane Craig, who want to say that there's a necessary being who has all these um, great making attributes that exists necessarily with all of these great making attributes, right? So it's not just you, you don't just have this simple being that exists, but that is existence, but you have a being who exists with all of these attributes, and that's your kind of brute necessity. And on the other side, uh, you have people like maybe Graham Oppie who say that, well, yeah, I also have a kind of metaphysical necessity that has properties as well. And how is it that you can argue that your metaphysical necessity is better than my metaphysical necessity? We're both starting at the same starting point, right? But Thomism kind of goes deeper than that, yes. right? Right. It, it, it provides it, like a deeper level of, ec- of explanation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a sufficient reason. Well, I think that that's right. And this is something that classical theists um, 
they sometimes have been accused of being really annoying about this, right? But I think that there's a, a deep insight here. <laughs> yeah. Is that like as soon as you take like the God of a uh, Dr. Bill Craig, and God bless him, I love a lot of his work. I've, I've absolutely been, I've, be I've benefited from it. His his uh, book on Platonism is really interesting and cool, even though I don't ultimately adopt this position. So just a, a lot of really good things to say about him. But I fundamentally disagree about his philosophy of God, and the reason being is it doesn't seem like he has adequately escaped the creature creator category, right? Uh, and I know you talked about this fairly recently with James Dolezal, so I'm not just going to repeat all the points that he said, but I would totally agree with that, right? Um, mm -hmm. What you're saying of God, could you just say it of an angel is, I think, like a, a good test. Yeah. But even even that, right, is like the Thomas is saying, look, you have these are the sorts of categories, compositeness being a big one, right? And this is this is why if you if you're a theist who has some sort of complexity, even just metaphysical complexity, heaven help us if you put physical complexity in God, but even yeah. just metaphysical complexity in God, right? Then it seems like we're we've lost that those sort of relevant differences. And now, like, you've lost a huge, I think, advantage, if you want to call it that, when doing battle with the naturalist. Right. Um, now you're just going to have to do like a complete like inference to the best explanation and hope that my theory it's, that's right can somehow be simpler in some regards. And, and to me, that is where that project goes off the rails. And this was one of the big, Agreed. big reasons I wanted to start with the metaphysical approach first. Right to show that the God of classical theism really does escape all these categories, does not have these, what I call a kind of contingency or dependency implying attributes I engage to just the apophatic theology, right? To show that there is a principled difference, a real category shift here uh, of this of this entity that we're talking about that is supposed to ground everything else um, th that could, and this is the only sort of thing Right. The only sort of thing I have the whole section on brute facts that can reduce brute facts to zero. Right. Exactly. Because it's, the, it's yeah. the only sort of thing that can um, kind of fill the role of what many think comes out of the ontological argument. Right. Without me having to run an ontological argument. Uh -huh. Right. And a being that is just pure existence, pure perfection, pure power, divine simplicity all the way through. And then, you know, do whatever philosophy you, you want or need to just, you know, show that that's it seems coherent, like it's right? the only way to reach an ultimate reality without having to posit some kind of bruteness, whether, it. whether it's a brute contingency or a brute necessity, or, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna get to an ultimate reality, it's going to have to be a being that is just existence itself and absolutely simple. And in, and, a, in a, a being in which the sufficient reason for its existence is within its own nature. It explains yes. its own existence. It doesn't cause its own existence. Those are different. Yeah. But it does explain its own necessary existence. Right. The, the idea there, and this is this is exactly um, the, the point that I, I try to make, is that ultimately, if the universe is fully intelligible, there needs to be something that can explain everything else and somehow explain itself. Yes. Right? Self-explanatory. And you pointed out rightfully that not all explanations are causes, right? Why don't square circles exist? Well, they're contradictory structures and contradictions are impossible. That's an explanation, but it's not a causal one, right? Um, so the idea is, is that there ha if, re if PSR is true, there has to be some reality that if we could grasp its essence, which we're not in a position to do, right? Mm -hmm. There would be no mystery remaining about its existence, right? And right. then I argue that what the cosmological argument gives us is a theoretical theoretical entity and the only sort of theoretical entity that, that seems like it could is a plausible candidate for that sort of thing and yeah. anything else that isn't that just wouldn't be the sort of thing that could be the ultimate explanation of everything else the ultimate explanation of everything including itself right you need right. to make those clear category shifts and if you're positing bruteness kind of at any level right even if it's like three fewer brutenesses right if you will right <laughs> well you've got five brutenesses i've only got three i don't care if you got one you're in trouble as far as i'm concerned right because yeah. again there's no there's no relevant difference either reality is fully intelligible at the end of the day or it's not well correct so me if care. i'm wrong I, but it, I, this is oppie's argument right i'm i mean i it's been a while since i read oppie but he's basically like look you have to start with bruteness and i'm starting with bruteness too you know, many what, many naturalists will, will claim that that everybody's stuck with sort of bruteness and i deny that right i say yeah, no right. not not properly understood uh there's a difference between and i talk about this in the book a brute fact and an autonomous fact right and an autonomous fact is that once you kind of grasp its nature or the constituents of the nature like the question vanishes right why why do mountains have valleys well once you understand the nature of mountain and valley uh -huh. you can see that wherever there's a mountain there's a valley stuff like that right so i argue that the the classical theist doesn't have a brute fact 
they have an autonomous fact mm-hmm. anchoring everything at the bottom. And the only thing that could be that ultimate autonomous fact is that sort of thing that, you know, Anselm was after, right? However, I I have mixed feelings on whether there's a sound independent ontological argument. That's another thing. But I say, don't worry about it because the cosmological argument gives us reason to think there is a sound it gets ontological you there. Yep. argument. Right. And then that's the thing that can reduce brute facts to zero. Yeah. 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 I totally well, agree with amen, that. Amen, man. Yeah. Amen. I, I, um, you know, I'm classical theist through and through, and I am just, one of my missions here is just to urge, especially the Protestant church back to classical theism for, for the very reasons that we're talking about here, because it gets you to that ultimate reality. It gets you to that ultimate ground, fundamental ground of all being. Yeah. And you need that when you go up against these sophisticated atheists. Um, that are just, you know, they just want a sword fight with bruteness, right? <laughs> you have your bruteness, I have mine. So anyway, um, let's move on, because that's just that's just the first third of your book. Um, I know we're running out of time here, but uh, I, want, I want to say something about the second part of the book, where you engage sure. in worldview comparison as a kind of secondary support um, for, for theism. And of yeah. course, you narrow down here uh, on a comparison between theism on the one hand and then naturalism, on the other hand, so so um, Pat, how do we go about evaluating and comparing worldviews? What makes yeah. for a good explanation when it comes to these large scale or grand pictures of reality? Sure, yeah. So a worldview for people who are unfamiliar, you can just kind of think of it as a philosophical big picture, a philosophical theory of everything, right? Um, and it should be systematic, uh, and there should be. I think that there are largely agreed upon explanatory targets for a worldview, and I I list what I think are ones that are just obviously explanatory targets but part of the difficulty is people will quibble about that right but i say hey contingency seems like a worldview should be able to make sense of that the emergence of consciousness okay it seems like we should be able to make sense of that rationality right abstract thinking um the moral dimension right and that 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 one might is an interesting one because i do more or less just assume a sort of moral realism in the book so if somebody's a more anti-realist or nihilist maybe that won't have as much um sway with them uh and and that just real quick that kind of shows um the give and take here the kind of the 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 play of things because sometimes data can you know help you form or determine your theory but sometimes if you already have a theory it will help you to determine your data or how you interpret data right so if you're already kind of a committed naturalist or reductionist right your theory might and i actually i think this is right right your theory would probably veer you towards a moral anti-realism right but if you're kind of like me and you think that there's a lot going for more realism. Well, then that might be a reason to jettison naturalism, for example, right? And even more fundamentally, I think it's a concern. Morality, I think, is fundamentally a concern of human nature and teleology at the end of the day. So if you think that there really are natures and that there's natural directedness or aims of things, then I think that gives you really good reason to be a theist because theist, theism better predicts and anticipates that sort of thing. So anyways, I go through this this this, this list of all this stuff. Order stability is another one. I, I don't cover all of it in the book, but I pick like four or five that I think are really significant and, and kind of drive home the point. And I make the case uh, that classical theism, in conjunction with the kind of background metaphysics that is concomitant with it, uh, like strongly predicts all of this stuff. Like it's just the sort of thing you would expect to occur if classical theism is true, but it's not at all the sorts of stuff you would expect to occur if the principle of indifference, namely atheistic naturalism is true. And that in order, so like, for example, if just like to put it in a cartoonishly simple way, if God exists in his subsistent goodness and understands himself as the, you know, the, the height of all perfection, right? Um, Someone might ask, well, why would God create? There's, you know, it's not like God has anything to gain. But, you know, upon a little reflection, and this again is in the tradition, uh, I think you realize that there's kind of two ways to to enjoy goodness. You can just kind of rest in it or you can share it, right? And the tradition has always maintained that the sort of impulse or the motive, not not the determining one, but the motive for God to create would be to diffuse his goodness. So I developed this principle of the very traditional principle of the goodness is naturally self-diffusive, right? And that if God is going to create, it's not surprising that he's going to bring about other uh, beings like us because God, you know, doesn't want to just share the goodness of existence, but he wants to share the goodness of himself, which requires union, right? And union, you know, friendships, love and union requires, you know, the uniting of two wills, independent free wills and stuff like that, right? So I I show how that like you can get uh, a real positive probability 
of these features that I think are undeniable, right, from a classical theistic worldview, uh, conscious beings, rational beings, free beings, and then, of course, with those beings like us, demands that you have a physical universe in which we can emerge. So comes order, stability, and fine-tuning and all this or that, right? And like, like, I think this is all immensely obvious. In fact, the only real, and even many atheists will will frankly admit, like, yeah, all this stuff fits really well with theism. Uh, but the problem with theism isn't that it doesn't predict uh, enough. It's that it predicts too much. And there's the problem with evil, right? It's like a perfect God, where's the perfect world type of deal, right? And hey, fair enough. Theists have to tell a story about that. And my final chapter, I tell one of the best stories I know how to, right? But setting that one thing aside, uh, you can then go and ask, well, what about naturalism? Does it predict all this? And then like just starting with a bare atheism, God does not exist. What do you expect from that? Nothing, right? Principle of indifference, what do you expect from that? Nothing. So what you need to start doing is you need to start specifying. You need to start complicating at the root of your theory. And in a general structural way, this kind of creates two problems. The more you kind of complicate and specify at the root, the more you're going to leave brute and unexplained. And the more internally complicated your theory becomes. So which makes it intrinsically less plausible, uh, probable, as I argue in the book. So whereas theism starts with a very simple root that I argue can serve as that sort of autonomous fact from which you get all these consequences, however grand and complicated it is up here, the root itself is very simple, right? Whereas for atheism to kind of keep up in the explanatory game with predictions, it has to build more at the root. That is ultimately left kind of brute and unexplained. So that's a problem because now we're, we're losing out on explanatory comprehensiveness as we're increasing complexity to make sense of physical setup and fine tuning and consciousness and rationality. And if they want to go to morality, that's a whole other story they're going to have to tell if they're not going to be eliminativist or nihilist about it. Right. And that's where we really get into that whole cumulative case. Um, and we can dive into any of those aspects if you want. But that's the kind yeah. of general structure, the strategy that, that I take. And then. Really, the the last and most provocative one would be the section on suffering and evil. Uh, yeah. But I'll I'll pause there for yeah. Yeah. So um, you 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 show that you know when it comes to evaluating worldviews, really there's a couple of characteristics that kind of take precedence: simplicity, and then uh, explanatory scope and power. Uh, simplicity. I just don't think there's any game in town that can compete with classical theism because we have the, the doctrine of divine simplicity. So I, it's hard for me to imagine that there is any starting point that has a more a simple explanation than classical theism. Um, but we kind of we kind of talked to that point already. And then when it comes and, to- And for those who are wondering that, I, I look at various um, theories of simplicity in my book and I show kind of no matter how you think about it with ontological simplicity theoretical simplicity like at the end of the day theism clearly has the, yes the, the advantage on in these departments for right? sure and and also argue that simplicity matters most at the fundamental level with the root so even if theism has more things floating about above it angels and stuff like that right that's pretty much irrelevant right what matters is what's at the bottom yeah yeah good point um and then when it comes to explanatory scope or I think you call it comprehensiveness. Yeah, I think here, again, I think there's just a general intuition, common sense, that's just gonna say, yeah, I mean, I think uh, theism better explains consciousness and rationality, better explains our moral experience. Now, if you're a naturalist, I don't think naturalism even does explain these things. I think instead what it does is it's forced to explain them away, right? It doesn't explain them, it just mm -hmm. denies them. And you uh, you showed this really well in your book, and for me this is these these are strong marks against naturalism because if your worldview has to deny rationality and consciousness because they're they're fundamentally committed to a, some kind of a physical reductionism, for example, yes, right, uh -huh. or if if you have to deny moral realism, well, again, you know you can do that. It's possible to take that position. It's it's possible to form that kind of a skepticism. I would argue that in certain senses, especially when it comes to the rationality question, it's ultimately self-defeating. However, you certainly can deny these things and be a skeptic. But again, uh, the cost for doing that is enormously high. Mm -hmm. You know, to deny moral realism, for example, that is a high cost to pay. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so anyone can be willing to, to pay that cost. That's fine. But in my opinion, that's a, a mark against yes. your view. Well, and you brought up a good point, right? If you're a naturalist, I think it, your your best bet, right? If you're going to 
try and say you have an, an epistemological or explanatory advantage is you have to sort of be a hard bar, ball kind of physicalist and reductionist, mm -hmm. right? And as soon as you do that, I don't think you you have a, a chance in hell of making sense of consciousness or rationality or even a lot of biology for that matter, right? Or even, right, there's a lot in philosophy of science that argues like that reductionism is just a total failure, right? It just yeah. it isn't, it isn't doing, it just doesn't work, right? Uh, whereas a more theistic worldview gives you I would argue a, a broadly Aristotelian view, right, where you have substantial forms um, and all that good stuff where you can can make sense of uh, even even like strong emergence. Right. Whereas the idea of strong emergence in a naturalistic worldview, you know, I like how David Bentley Hart puts it sometimes is like just just replace it with the word magic in any paper that, you know, talks about strong emergence and you haven't you haven't really lost anything, right? <laughs> yeah. right. But but in a in a theistic worldview, like right, you can have intelligible structures where there are certain conditions are met where you know uh new forms are induced and higher levels of reality come about and you have system level properties and and top-down causation, like all that fits really well in a theistic worldview. Um, but you're gonna have a really hard time in many cases, if not an impossible time in other cases explaining the things that need to be explained with a sort of hardball reductionism but then at that but if you give that up right and you take a sort of more exotic naturalism well now um again this is like okay you can go this way or that and either way is going to create problems right well now you've lost what i was told especially when i was a naturalist is a sort of primary motivation for being a naturalist in the first place which is a sort of broad scientism uh -huh. right um that science is this, you know, don't go be the beyond the science this is a sort of cliche, right? Science has got this. It can give us all the explanation that we actually need. Well, as soon as you you, you sort of give up that um, reductionist attitude, you've essentially given up on the scientism, right? Which was one of the, pri which was, if not probably the primary motivation for many naturalists to begin That's with. That's a good point. Right. Um, so you can do that if you want. I still think that at the end of the day, these more exotic forms of naturalism fail to explain all the things that need to be explained. Because they also complicate the theory, don't they? Exactly, right. Like and if you're going to be a moral realism, in my opinion, and maybe I just haven't looked into this enough, but if you're going to be a moral realist and be a naturalist, you got to go in for some kind of Platonism. Or Aristotelianism, right? right? Um, or Aristotelianism that isn't ultimately grounded. Yes, and uh, and this is sort of the moral argument I give in my book is that I do argue that I think it comes down to nature and teleology, but that itself commits you to an act of potency distinction, and that itself is set you up for the cosmological argument for God. So uh, in my yeah. in my sense, moral arguments actually sort of bleed into cosmological arguments. Um, I think that's the right way to think about it, which actually sort of makes sense when you think about Agreed. the relation yeah. of, of God and creation, right? Um, so yeah, like you can kind of do that if you want, but now you're going to have complicated your theory, lost what was one of the original, if not biggest motivations for being a naturalist. And you've also left uh, a number of things unintelligible or brute at the end good. of the day. Yeah. Right? Good. Yeah. Does that make so, sense? Uh, absolutely. Um, a couple minutes left here. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to neglect the last chapter of your book where you deal with the problem of evil, because that is so important. That's the yeah. other objection that Aquinas gives, uh, the two possible objections. Um, so can you just give us just the, the quick elevator pitch of, of how you respond to the problem of evil oh. in the book? Boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I mean, I always want to be respectful of this one for many reasons. It is, it's a big issue to grapple with philosophically and, of course, just personally and emotionally and spiritually. So I'm always hesitant to give like a quick answer to it. Uh, and rest assured, the answer in my book is is not quick. It's, it might be one of the longest, longest it's the longest chapters, chapter, right? I think. All right. So, um, right. So I'm mostly concerned with the evidential problem of evil. As people who are familiar with these debates, there's kind of two versions of the problem of evil. There's the logical problem, which is a very strong assertion. There's something about the evil and suffering of this world that is strictly incompatible with God. And I think most philosophers these days, even though you see the occasional attempted resuscitation of the logical problem of evil, have said, no, nah, this, this doesn't work because for all we know, there might be some morally um, justified reason for God to permit the suffering and evil, even if we have no idea what it is, right? Nobody's proven that there, there isn't or can't be. So where the conversation has largely shifted is the evidential problem of, evil of essentially saying this, well, look, the distribution lines of suffering in this world are just better predicted by naturalism, right? It's just more likely that we would have a world with this much suffering and awfulness and evil, especially the grotesque and horrendous evils, if God does not exist, then if God exists. So there's a lot 
a lot to be said about this and there's a lot that has been said, but my general, let me give the general strategy that I think is ultimately correct on this, right? There's kind of one, two, one, two punch here, right? The first uh, punch is one that I don't think is taken enough. And that is really challenging that assumption that naturalism does predict uh, a world like ours with this distribution of suffering. And I challenge that assumption by looking into naturalistic philosophies of mind, right? And surveying the range of options and saying, hey, uh, a lot of naturalistic philosophy of mind veers into epiphenomenalism, which makes it really hard to make sense of why pain is there at all, uh, because the qualitative aspect would appear to be functionally useless, right? It's, it's the physics underneath about getting our joints into the right place. So even if you could explain how the qualitative dimension emerged on naturalism, uh, you don't have a good explanation that it would emerge or that it would emerge in the way that it has, which is a way that appears to be psychophysically harmonious, right? Um, that's something that's like a huge mystery if if naturalism, too, which which is taking away the claim that naturalism actually has a good explanation of the felt aspects of suffering, which is kind of what's up for concern right now, right? But then just to kind of um, close off other options, and again, this is this is a fairly technical part of the book, so I will just. I have to point readers there. I'll say that the same argument could be made for reductionist theories, functionalism, type, type, whatever, right? That is general theories. They do not predict the distribution lines of suffering that we have. You would have to highly specify and complicate them to get that prediction. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking away from the naturalist, right? Of saying like, look, not only do you not have a good explanation of this world of suffering, I argue you have no explanation, Right. And at that point, even if the theist gives like the craziest theodicy in the world, right? Some explanations better than no explanation, right? So I kind of I'm trying to make the job easier for the theist, right? Um, but I don't think you need to do that because I actually think you can give a very robust and good theodicy. And what I do in my theodicy is I use a lot of traditional insights. Traditional insights concerning the good is self-diffusive, what the motives for creation are of, of union, metaphysics of love, what that requires, which I'm committed to a libertarian free will. Also, higher spiritual entities that are um, through which creation is mediated, delegated, have that has a lot to say on certain distribution lines of suffering. And then I combine insights from Eleanor Stump. And her, I think, quite magisterial work on the problem of evil and suffering. And I synthesize that with insights from other thinkers like Peter von Inwagen, who I think has some really important stuff to say on uh, issues concerning vagueness and arbitrariness, which helps to deal with, you know, uh, admittedly difficult cases of, of 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 suffering and stuff like that. And ultimately, and at the end of the day, I, I am, am trying to tie these pieces together to say, hey, when you think about theism really deeply and everything that it sort of predicts, uh, even though superficially it might seem like this world is and it's suffering anyways is evidence against the existence of God upon substantial inspection, it's evidence for the existence of God. None of that is to say that suffering itself is good. I'm, I'm not claiming that, right? I'm just showing from a sort of predictive stance that this world is not surprising given classical theism and other, I think, very highly plausible assumptions concerning the metaphysics of love and, and free will and how God would um, mediate creation and stuff like that. And then once you have the sort of substantial analysis of each worldview concerning the the, the data of suffering, I argue it, it actually tips quite decisively in favor of of theism. And I always, I don't think you need to say this, but I always say it anyways, is that even if you thought that none of that was right, and I do think it, I do think it's absolutely true and correct. And I make the best case I can in the book, but even if you thought that none of that was right at the end of the day, you could just, as a theist, I think even just say, okay, fine. Maybe your worldview does better predict suffering, but then still make the case that it's completely overpowered or outweighed by all the other considerations yeah. in favor of theism as well. So there's a number of ways that people could go about responding to it, but that's that's the strategy I take in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So often when it comes to worldview comparison, I think Elvin Plantica points this out well. Um, the the anti-theist just likes to throw the problem of evil in the face of the theist as if it were like in a vacuum, right? Here's the problem yeah. of evil, deal with it. But that's just not the way that that we go about worldview comparison, because you can't just deal with the problem of evil in isolation. Mm -hmm. You have to bring all of your background knowledge into yes. the 
into the question, into the debate, including all of your arguments for the existence of God, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and even your theology. And, yeah. you know, what does the Bible say about this? So I think you do a really good job. And not putting... just that, but real quick, but same thing for the naturalists. It's like you, it, it, exactly. world, new comparison needs to be systematic. It's not enough just to say, oh, suffering's not surprising because evolution and that, you know, helps explain pain and pleasure. So we, you know, have sex and avoid bears. So I, well, hold on, because <laughs> you have a lot of other commitments to naturalism, including in philosophy of mind and yes. the relation between the mental and physical. How does that bear in on all this? And then like, yes. once you study that, you realize evolution ain't going to help you. Right. Because evolution, it, like this problem is deeper down or further out than what evolution can actually help to explain. Right. So my fun. And this is actually kind of Plantigian because in his book, you know, where the conflict really lies, his whole thesis is like, look, superficially, you think science and religion are at odds, but substantially, they're very harmonious. Whereas it's the reverse with naturalism. Superficially, uh-huh. you think naturalism and science are friends, but substantially, they're actually very much at odds. I'm saying pretty much the same thing about the problem of evil. Superficially naturalism and the problem of suffering seem to like make sense together right whereas superficially theism and evil don't seem to make sense together but i'm saying substantially it's act when you really think about it it's it's actually the reverse theism is really the only worldview that i think does predict a world like ours at least in uh, broadly right uh whereas naturalism once you really think about it does not get the same sort of predictive success on this matter. that's right yeah great chapter there Um, thank you so, okay. Well, again, the book is titled The Best Argument for God, and you can pre-order it right now on Amazon. Pat, great job here. Uh, I really enjoyed reading this book. I fully endorse it. Uh, I encourage everybody out there to pre-order a copy today. I really hope that you sell a lot of these, brother. Oh, well, so, thank you, brother. God bless you. And this is this has been a joy. We should definitely do this again at some point. Absolutely. Thanks for chatting w- with me today, uh, Pat. It's been a joy. Thank you all.